Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Tom Vanderbilt, presenting his new book, Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. He will be talking with Oliver Berkman, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Tom, Oliver, and the team at Knopf for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. There are just a few housekeeping things before we get started. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. But the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. There are a few different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and to interact with your fellow attendees. But if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered, please post that question in the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling the questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting them there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Beginners, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Tom's book and many others on site. Or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat in a moment. Tom will also be stopping by Greenlight to sign copies of Beginners, so if you indicate in the order comments field at checkout that you'd like a signed copy, we can get that to you. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Oliver Berkman. He is a featured writer for The Guardian. He is a winner of the Foreign Press Association's Young Journalist of the Year Award and has been shortlisted for the Orwell Prize. He writes a popular weekly column on psychology, This Column Will Change Your Life, and has reported from New York, London, and Washington. He is the author of The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. His new book, 4,000 we Weeks, Time Management for Mortals, will be published in summer of 2021. He lives in New York City. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Tom Vanderbilt. Tom has written for many publications, including the New York Times Magazine, the Wall Street Journal Magazine, Popular Science, Financial Times, Smithsonian, and London Review of Books, among many others. He is the contributing editor of Wired UK, Outside, and Art Forum. He is uh, author previously of the books you may also like, Taste in, the, in an Age of Endless Choice, Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do and What It Says About Us, and Survival City, Adventures Among the Ruins of Atomic America. He has appeared on a wide range of television and radio programs, from the Today Show to the BBC World Service to NPR's Fresh Air. He has been a visiting scholar at NYU's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, a research fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture, a fellow at the Design Trust for the Public Space, and a winner of the Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, among other honors. He lives in Brooklyn. His new book, Beginners, is a thought-provoking, playful journey into the transformative ways that come, uh, transformative joys that come with starting something new, no matter your age. Weaving comprehensive research and surprising insight gained from his year of learning dangerously, Vanderbilt shows how anyone can get better at beginning again, and more importantly, why they should take those first awkward steps. Tom will be speaking with Oliver, and then afterwards with all of you. Please take it away, Tom and Oliver. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Katie. I, I guess I'll just start, thanks everyone for joining. I, I guess I'll just start by saying a little bit about why this book, uh, this book, resonated uh, so much with me and sort of sit, caught me at a time that I feel like I really needed to read it. And then I will uh, loop into the first question from there, I guess. It reminded me that um, a few, uh, a couple of years ago, I remember being totally unexpectedly moved, I guess is the word, by, by the news, by discovering uh, a report in a newspaper about an interview that, um, Rod Stewart had given to uh, a railway modeling specialist magazine in the UK, in which he'd revealed that he'd spent his whole career as a rock singer working uh, in his spare time on an incredibly elaborate um, model railway layout based on I think, uh, some amalgam of 1940s Chicago and New York City. Um, he, he used to um, demand an extra hotel room for it when he was on tour so that he could continue 
uh, working on his um, model railway. Since then, he's been involved in a couple of things that make me not want to sort of put him forward as a, as a great model of uh, humanity necessarily. But, but there was something so striking to me about this idea that even for even somebody with all this money and profile and no need to do anything for the rest of his life and the position to sort of just chase hedonistic pleasure or do whatever he wanted to do, clearly felt this, this, this need in life for, for a, a, a skill that he was learning that had no sort of profit potential. If anything, it goes against the brand of Rod Stewart, I'd say, to be, uh, to be uh, doing something sort of so kind of, I don't know, introspective and, and, uh, and solitary. Um, and I realized then, and then this book really spoke to me about it, that there is this kind of myth, this kind of gap in that I feel in my own in my own uh, life about uh, hobbies. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about whether you think this book really is about hobbies necessarily, but how sort of illegitimate it feels uh, day to day in you know in this economy, and and as busy as we all are, and as aware of the world suffering as we as we all are, and uh, of the sort of crazy news as we are just literally this week. It almost feels like a sort of unacceptable indulgence to even contemplate uh, learning chess, learning to surf, learning singing, all the things that you explore so uh, fascinatingly and often really hilariously in, in this book. Um, so I guess I'm just asking you if you could talk about like what triggered your own journey and and why why this why this matters, why that should be allowed to to matter given the length of our to-do list? Um, great question, questions. Thank you, Oliver. And uh, one reason I'm so excited that you are doing this is because of your book. You know, I, I sort of hate positive thinking and it, positive thinking sort of like, that, that is not my past at all. So th this book is very much about positive thinking. So it's a bit of a departure, but, um, and just thanks to everyone out there who's, who's listening tonight. I know we'd probably all rather be doom scrolling through the, the fate of the, of the Republic uh, as it stands, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can take a little break and just talk about so, a little bit more of a, in a self-care uh, mode, which kind of relates to what you were just saying, Oliver. Yeah, you know, I started this book a while ago, well before the pandemic. So those were the before times, the simpler times. Um, would I have started this book in March? Uh, probably not. Although, I mean, it, it is an interesting, it's been an interesting year. Uh, in some ways, the pandemic has number one turned us all into beginners in, in terms of the way we just have to reinvent ourselves, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we sort of school, all, all these things. So it's put us on sort of this beginner's footing. Um, of course, people have had a bit more time in some cases, not everyone, but, uh, you know, and this has obviously led to this huge explosion in, I mean, the sites, Duolingo, uh, course horse, I mean, all these sort of online learning platforms, which have exploded, you know, have had a had, had banner year because people, you know, I think people find, people have this sort of massive disruption of, of habits and, and habitual behavior is one of the things I, I think that prevents you from ever getting around to these things that are on, on your list that you probably have. And, and that I had, I had this list of five or six things that haunted me throughout my entire life. Um, is it indulgent? Yeah, it feels, plenty indulgent, uh, you know, especially e even when you have a book contract to be sort of doing these things and, you know, book contract being what it is, I still had sort of a day job. Um, it, it was hard to convince myself sometimes as I was going surfing on, on a Tuesday afternoon that this was work in some regards. This is, this is you know, I, I have a Protestant work ethic here. Uh, this is hard for me to pull off, but, um, you know, I think, uh, in some ways more than ever, we, we needed those things this year though, uh, you know, being being cooped up inside. And I, I know that, you know, some people turn to things that really sort of got them through this. I, I and I know you're a singer as well. I, uh, I wouldn't go that far, but I, yeah, well, <laughs> we can talk about that. But anyway, yes, it's, yeah. But anyway, you know, I, I, we can talk about that later, but having joined this choir that I sort of immediately fell in love with and then having that after, you know, a little while taken away from me suddenly because it turns out choirs are one of the most, yes. you know, sort of viral events you can participate in in the entire world. Um, that This massive hole opened up in my life, which I tried to, you know, sort of recreate with some, some online stuff, which wasn't quite there. But anyway, so I was missing all these very therapeutic things in my life suddenly, like, like a lot of people were. So a uh, very, very long-winded way of, of answering that, um, if I have. 
I, I sense a kind of interesting and I think very productive tension all the way through this book between the idea that this is something, these are the kinds of things that we should make space for in our lives because it will make us happier, because there are sort of ancillary benefits that actually will help the sort of um, uh, more directly kind of career oriented uh, um, goals that people have, but, but also just for something about the intrinsic pleasure of of improving at things. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this idea of getting better at, through maybe talking about one or two of the, the specific skills that you, that you explored here, because there is one way of thinking about this in, as you say, self-care terms, which would just be that like, we should be having some downtime in our lives. And it doesn't really matter if we're not sort of engaging in a, in a, in a process of learning. You are very specifically making the case here for for ending up better at something than you started, even if e even if being sort of world class is 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 out of the question for you in a specific domain, is that right? I mean, yeah. I mean, and and don't get me wrong. You know, I, I love the idea of mastery, and I I would love to have written a book. Let's say that I just took one of these things chess and and sort of like let's say Maria Konnikova's interesting new book about poker you know she became a poker champion I mean I I would love to be a poker champion I'd love to be great at poker I'd love to be great at chess you know I'm pretty good at chess I'm trying to get better it's not something that I have the stereotypical you know 10,000 hours for I'm lucky to have 100 hours sort of cobbled together over the course of this um and you know but I think going into it I was very self self-consciously aware of well should this be about you know, a lot of people would want to do something like make a career change, be a beginner in that way. And I think there are a lot of already interesting books out there about that. Um, I wasn't looking for a career change. I happen to love my job. But as I, as I point out in the book, you know, this is something and kind of goes back to what you're saying about Rod Stewart. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill wrote this, you know, a keen amateur painter wrote this interesting little book about painting. And he made the point that the people who love their jobs are the ones who need this most of all, actually, because they're so can be so passionate, so wrapped up in what they're doing that they never take time away. I mean, the person who has sort of a dreary job that they they hate may seek escape in all these sorts of pursuits. Um, it's those that, you know, to, to, and why would we even want that? Well, I think to just sort of get that, get that sense of distance, to, to have that sense of starting over at something again, because I, I think it's a humbling, sort of empathic, uh, ennobling thing to go, to go through this process at, rather than, you know, I could have, it, it's easier for me, easy for anyone to sort of stick with what you're good at and say, okay, I'll just, you know, stick to writing and whatever else. It, it, if, if people think I'm good at writing, I'm not going to presume anything out there, but, you know, uh, let's- <laughs> You are, but it's, 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 well, <laughs> it's not, maybe it's not appropriate for you to say, but you really are. Yes, carry on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the world, the world doesn't need another amateur singer, to be sure. I'm not, I'm not like changing the world by doing any of this stuff. I mean, I think I needed to be an amateur singer, and I think amateur singers need each other. But I think it just goes back to this thing that, you know, uh, another thing from the book is uh, the writer John Casey quoting Kurt Vonnegut, you know, talking about when some, you know, a person like Rod Stewart, when you get to that level of acclaim, you know, in some ways they like to be flattered for their minor secret vanities, I think was the word he used, rather than the thing that they're known for. So, you know, Rod Stewart had this little side, you, you sort of get tired of being the person you are in a sense, and you want to have this kind of secret little sub development thing going on. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, how does this relate to work though, I will just quote briefly from uh, David Epstein's great book, Range, which is very complimentary book that came up before minded, of course, but he quotes a study that talks about Nobel Prize winning scientists. The ones who had won the Nobel were 22 times more likely to have been an amateur uh, mu musician, performing artist, uh, actor, magician, you name it, than non-Nobel Prize winning scientists. Now, it's not likely that learning ballroom dancing, you know, help make someone, help someone have this breakthrough in quantum physics, but there must be something about this willingness to engage in these ancillary pursuits, to, to meet different people, to think in different ways, to, to open yourself to experience, to look like a fool. Maybe it just, it, it jarred something in those scientists that helped them make these creative breakthroughs that then led to the Nobel. Just, that's just speculative, of course. No, but it's fascinating. I, I'm really interested to ask you about, I mean, you start this journey by talking about 
uh, becoming a parent and and the sort of inherent beginner quality of that the way that you can't reasonably meaningfully uh, prepare for 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 that experience but also the experience of being uh, of, of of you know caring for a newborn because there is this just bafflingly paradoxical weird situation about babies that they are on the one hand like totally stupid really um in terms of uh in terms of their sort of independent functioning as beings but on the other hand you know there, there will never be at any point in their lives from then on it's just downhill in terms of their extraordinary capacity to learn you know there's, there's a genius for learning precisely at the point in your life when you sort of can't do anything. I don't know if that is a paradox, but but I mean, so you're actually not only experiencing parenting as as a sort of example of of not knowing what you're doing, but having to do it anyway, and the stakes being high, but uh, but have this sort of model of learning in front of you uh, all the time. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, as and I'll just plug my wife's book one more time here. But as as the husband of a woman, Jancy Dunn, who wrote a book called How to Not Hate Your Husband After Kids. I clearly had things to learn about being a father, being thrust into this new role, uh, both husband and father, something I completely was unprepared for. I, I had done some reading, of course, um, but yeah, until this this child is in your hands, you know, you, you don't really know what's going on. I, I was completely caught flat footed. And it is a funny point you bring up, you know, so you're a beginner, I'm a beginner parent at that moment, holding this sort of ultimate beginner who, knows nothing except sort of the basic life functions and, and can recognize me after, you know, on the first day or whatever, these sort of fascinating things. But, um, and, and, and you, you hit on something there, which is why I thought, you know, these infants, these are the ultimate beginners. We were all once there. Of course, we were all these, these life novices. So I, I made it a point to go to uh, the Infant Action Lab at New York University, which is a fascinating place where the researchers study how infants move and learn and learn to move, beginning you know, with crawling and, and, and standing and bum shuffling, these other sorts of things that they do, they do and then finally segueing into walking. And, uh, you know, I walked away with all sorts of, of insights from that, you know, based largely upon how much they fail at these things. I mean, the, the, the statistics on, on the number of times a baby falls in an hour while learning to walk are, are sort of shocking, you know, up to, up to 70 times an hour. And, um, that the sheer amount of walking they actually do once they begin to learn is also shocking. I did this piece for the Wall Street Journal recently and the, the editors were <laughs> sort of in this um, tizzy because they, they thought the figure I had cited of, I think it's 2,400 uh, feet uh, per hour or eight football fields, um, they thought that there's no way that could actually be true. You have to check your sources on that. So I went back to Karen Adolph <laughs> at NYU and she gave me a, a 10, you know, peer reviewed studies showing, you know, and they, cause they, they film this stuff and track this stuff. Um, so the, the point being that, you know, that number one, we sort of forget, you know, we did, we did that 10,000 hours of, of, pra of deliberate practice in learning to walk. And, and so we became expert walkers and sort of learn what the failure rate is going on there. I think if, if you or I went to some, you know, I don't know, let's say ceramics class and we, we failed 70 times an hour, if we, we, we you know, we would walk away pretty discouraged, but um, in infants, you know, just have this amazing capacity to absorb failure, both both physically and well, I, mentally. They're not really thinking about it. Infants don't get you know, we don't get feedback on they don't get feedback on how they're walking. Um, we don't give infants drills on how to walk. We just let them experiment. This is sort of another thing I think you know to, to take away is that you know just that kind of sense of of play and experimentation in trying to learn something. Um, that drills will sort of only get you so far. You really need to open up and, and embrace these kind of failure moments, these falling moments, and, and change up your practice like infants do. Infants are just act completely randomly. Um, so in trying to learn something like juggling, for example, not just endlessly doing three balls, three balls, three balls in the same pattern, but starting with one hand, starting with another hand, doing it against the wall, walking to the kitchen, while juggling, um, trying to juggle upside down, closing your eyes, going outside on the sidewalk and juggling. People love that. But, um, you know, so just, and most of those things are gonna fail in the beginning. And, uh, you, you know, if I, I just, but I just can't stress enough how, how 
elemental failure is to learning and that doesn't feel good when, when you're 50 and you've built a life of, of competence and you that's a really good i mean it's a really it, it's certainly obvious now that you phrase it like that but i mean it, it is um obviously obviously you couldn't possibly develop from a newborn to to uh adolescence and adulthood if you if if from the very beginning it was a problem for you to to not know how to do things and to be and to be getting them wrong i mean and actually one of the most sort of i feel like one of the most sort of heartbreaking things about my son is just four but like i've just once or twice uh um i'm aware of, of him sort of responding to not being able to do something as if that's a problem of course for me not being able to do anything is a huge problem and that's why i'm not minded to to put myself into these kind of new situations so there's a big sort of uh there's a big sort of i don't know socialization issue or an issue with how we sort of uh come to function in the world that that causes you to think that there's some kind of uh that it, that it's a sort of strike against me that on my that if i try to do something new i'm going to i'm going to mess it up more times than i'm going to succeed because it's just literally the only way that anyone is ever going to learn something and it was apparently fine with me when i was 3 yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. My, I mean, my daughter, of course, learned to walk pretty late. So I was, as I was doing this research, I kept thinking back to this. And of course, she didn't know. She didn't care. She was she was doing fine as a crawler. She was a great crawler. I mean, she had taken crawling to near professional levels. And of course, you know, you know, by, by moving to walking, there, there's a because because I asked Karen Adolph at NYU this, I said, well, because it's very cumbersome to have to learn to walk. And once you've learned to crawl, none of that transfers over to learning to walk. It all gets wiped away. They do these crazy experiments where they have babies crawl up ramps and, and they approach the edge of the ramp and it, there's a certain drop and do babies feel comfortable going over the drop? And so as crawlers, they build up this experience and they know what to expect and, and what to fear. Then they become walkers and they suddenly they're charging up that ramp, ready to plunge off basically into their mother's arms because and I said, why, why don't they know that it's dangerous? They knew it was dangerous as a crawler. Why, why aren't they responding that way as a walker? And she said, well, you don't want babies to learn to fear anything. That, that's going to interrupt their learning process. Walking is such a fundamentally different thing than crawling. The walking infant is so much larger and so much, you know, so much muscular change has happened that it's a completely different sort of uh, being there that, you know, you just, the, the key takeaway though is you don't want to discourage them from trying anything and that putting, carrying over this, this legacy of, of risk, like, oh, I, I remember that slope, you know, crawling up that, that was pretty dangerous. I, be, I better not try that as a walker because half the time now as a walker, they could just cruise right over it, no problem. But, um, so I think you're exactly right though that, and this is something that kids really aren't aware of until they reach a certain age. And this has been very carefully sort of measured, but they don't know what they can't, do or what they're not supposed to do. So as when we were kids, we were probably all doing things like singing, drawing. We all thought we were great at everything. We wanted to try everything. Then at a certain age, you know, that begins to fall off because of both changes in, in school and also, you know, kids begin to think that they're not a, as good at some of these things or, and kids sort of get sorted in different groups. You know, oh, you're a math kid. You're a, you're an art kid. Um, so that's why <laughs> there's, Interesting studies, you know, by the time a person's in, in college, um, they've measured things like drawing ability or even singing ability and, and people regress. They were sort of like great at a certain point and then they just don't do it, they don't practice it. So they sort of go backwards. And so already at like age 18, you've lost a lot of that skill. Imagine now what happens, you're in your forties or fifties and you're trying to pick up this thing like drawing I mean, my drawing, the first drawing teacher I had said, you know, you're, you're basically drawing like an eight-year-old, like, like the eight-year-old that you were, because that's the last time I really drew. So, um, I mean, the whole, the whole point of the book is that you, you can get it back. You have to work at it, but uh, you shouldn't just magically assume that either because you, you, ha you haven't been doing it, that you can just keep on doing it or that it's going to be good without working that muscle. Um, Let's let's talk about the aging brain. Actually, this is something that feels very uh, feels very uh, uh, central to my to my life. I mean, <laughs> and, and perhaps chess is an obvious place to to go, just because it's well, it's one of the sort of excellent extended uh, treatments in the book, but also because it is the kind of thing where I kind of assume that 
one of the limitations on me were I to begin, like I know literally the, the rules of chess, but that, that's the end of my understanding. But it, it does feel like one of those things where if I were to begin now, there might be a, my age among other things, including just, you know, other kinds of inbuilt limitations, but might be something that you just, there's just a real basic like threshold beyond which it would be impossible to, to progress. I mean, I guess that's no less true of surfing, another of the examples in the, in the book. But I mean, talk a little bit about that. Is it, neuroplasticity does not mean that I can become like a math genius uh, now that I'm, now that I'm not in my twenties, even if, even if I was ever destined to have that potential earlier on, right? I mean, I mean, I think you still have a lot of plasticity. We have we have to disentangle some of the some of the correlative factors here. I mean, number one is is the time issue. If you look at, and let's let's just get out of the way that chess is obsessed with age. The whole there's something called the ELO rating in chess. That's how how good you are. That rating came about as as an age related study that an academic was doing. So, chess has always been obsessed with sort of you know, the young genius, and we we've seen it with the Queen's Gambit on Netflix. But um, you know children have a lot of time. Let, let's not forget that. I mean, a lot of time. Bobby Fischer, uh, you know, one of the great chess champions of all time was sort of a, you know, lonely bookish kid who sat in his room for hours on end, reading chess books, playing games, you know, against himself, became great. Now, Oliver, I would suggest that if you had eight or 10 days, eight, eight or 10 hours a day to sit in your room by yourself reading chess books, you know, you could go a pretty, far away yourself. Um, you know, it's not to say that there aren't, you're not going to have a little bit more cognitive inhibition, especially with, with learning a new thing. This is where, you know, from the studies I've seen, novices have a particularly hard time of it as they get older. If you once knew how to play chess and try to sort of get back into the game as an older person, it would be a bit easier for you. But, you know, there's all sorts of people out there who have become things like U.S. senior chess master, you know, who started pretty late in life. But, you know, I, we tend to get hung up on the idea, though, of, of the young genius. And, th and this happens to me when I was playing in tournaments where there were, it was mixed adults and kids. When I was playing an adult, if I lost to them, I would say, well, you know, I, he got lucky. I, I made a stupid blunder. I'll, I'll get the next one. But when this eight-year-old would, would beat me, I, I would just think, like, oh, I, I never stood a chance. That, that kid, you know, he's like the next Magnus Carlsen. I just right. attributed some inherent genius to that kid, whereas... The adult, I said, well, it was more about the circumstances and it was, it was anyone's game. Um, so I, we tend to, to get hung up on that idea, but there's, there's certainly no reason that, you know, it's usually other factors getting in the way that prevent these late blooming, you know, sort of geniuses, I think, including time, social expectation, all sorts of things. Uh, the cognitive piece is there for sure, especially as you, you know, age and age and age, but uh, the plasticity sort of never really goes away. I mean, they, I, I mentioned in the book, they, people studying aging will do these, they have this phrase practice effects, which they, they don't like because they sort of throw off the data. Practice effects means you gave someone a study, uh, like a, a sort of test, and they did better at, did, excuse me, they did better on it the second time because they got better at it. They took it once, had this score, then they took it another time and, and got better. And this happens the reason I bring this up is because the practice effects show up in aging studies as well. So people in their 80s or 90s, they're seeing these practice effects. They got better. It's not like, you know, so I, I think there's endless capacity for learning uh, until, you know, very late, maybe not become a, a grandmaster. That's uh, uh, not easy at any age, but yeah. And I mean, are we talking mainly here about skills and passions that you had had the ones that you chose to follow are they ones that you had had on on some level as a kid and you were sort of rediscovering or some of the ones in here kind of complete revelations to you as a as a sort of 40 something and, and uh yeah 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 no, i think they were things that I, I yeah were definitely in the back of my head for a long time and and singing i mean like a lot of people watching i'm sure is something you engage in right now. And I was engaging in it myself, but done in a sort of, you know, absent-minded way in the shower, in the car, not putting much thought into it. And I, I just started to wonder, you know, what what happens if you, if you begin to put some deliberate thought into it? Can you actually uh, improve? And I, so just in terms of like picking these things, I, I tried to 
make this short list of, of things that I really wanted to do and, and, and to learn and that were achievable within New York City. It didn't require too much, you know, exotic, like, like mountain climbing or something. Um, and that were, you know, that I could achieve a certain level of proficiency without going all in, like, like trying to learn a difficult language like like Mandarin or Arabic, um, which which you know would be amazing. But yeah, there, that's a whole book. Um, and one thing I, I will add though is that a, a lot of these things, you know, the learning process and and the doing of the thing were a bit different in the end in some ways than I sort of thought they would be, which was interesting to me. But and and or another way to think about about it is I didn't really know how much I would enjoy them or how much these things would would change me. So you, when you sort of have an idea of something in your head you know, it just lives there and, and you can kind of cultivate it, but to actually bring it out into the world, uh, I think is, is a different thing, but sorry. No, 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 go on. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say, but I, I, I didn't wanna make, you know, I really just wanted to have fun because I, I, we should not underestimate the, the importance of fun as, as a motivational factor in wanting to learn something there. You know, I had coding on my short list because I, I had asked people, "What? Hey, what should I learn? Uh, what should this? What uh, old? What new tricks should this old dog uh, learn?" And I mean, coding is great. I I, I would love to learn coding, but it felt a little, you know, like work to me, and and something that I didn't want to be necessarily hunched over the computer screen for you know, four more hours at, yeah. at night. So I, I really sort of wanted to get out of that sort of world a little bit. Um, so none of these things were had any relation to professional life but um but just yeah I mean this seems really important when I think about my own uh, you know I, I the closest I get to hobbies I guess it's it's it is singing and it is playing the piano I'm not uh, and having read this book I want to sort of try to get into some vein of getting better at these things at the moment I've been in a sort of 25 year holding pattern with my uh, capacities at the, for them but but one of the things that makes them clearly makes them fun is that I don't feel the pressure that I feel when I'm writing things that 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 comes from the fantasy that I might have sort of extraordinary success or the fear that I might sort of really screw it up and torch my career completely. Um, it, it is that it's it is less focused on the on the on the goal. Um, and I've noticed that you know you can, it, there is something vaguely embarrassing about the word uh, hobby and the idea of having a hobby in some circles, which there isn't if you call it a side hustle because then you have like roped it in to the um, to the to the the world of um, you know economic instrumentalism and you're trying to use it to to support yourself, which a lot of people need to do. But there's actually more sort of prestige, it seems to me, uh, associated with that too, and something kind of faintly faintly uh maybe embarrassing is the wrong word but about about sort of about doing things <laughs> that, don't, that don't seem to serve a a, a purpose in, in of that kind that's not a question but yeah no there's a fine line there, but, there, but there's a fine line between side hustle and hobby and and, and and there's a lot of tension out there and I, i've seen people you know sort of talking online about specifically not wanting to turn something into a side hustle want just not yeah. wanting to put that pressure on themselves. And, you know, uh, I, I sort of mentioned in the book, I, you know, about 10 years ago, I got heavily involved in, in road cycling. It sort of became my early middle age obsession. Uh, and there's the famous middle aged man in Lycra, the mammal. I became one of these people. And it was an amazing experience. You know, I went through the whole, the ladder of, of trying to get better. And, and you know, I, I quickly found, though, that these things can be kind of obs obsessive. And, you uh, I, I, the better I got, the faster I got, you know, the harder the training became, the less fun the, the practice rides became. People didn't want to stop for coffee and a, and a donut, which to me is the only reason to ride. Um, so I was just talking about uh, constantly about what, what they were eating and, and it just started to feel like work. Right. I, I didn't want like more performance benchmarks in, in my life. It's not that I didn't want to push myself in some ways, but it just was so regimented that, you know, I sort of, so then when something like surfing came along where I had absolutely no idea how to do it, number one, but then, you know, what, how good I should be that there really aren't that many numbers in surfing, which is a great thing that, you know, there aren't, you can't get a belt in surfing, like in, like in martial arts, or there's no rating in surfing. You don't know what your, your Watts you're producing, like you do on your bike. So surfing to me was just, it, it wiped the slate 
clean and I could just have this freedom to, to have no expectations. Um, I didn't have, uh, you know, in, uh, imposter syndrome, which I feel constantly as, as a writer, uh, because I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be anyone. I was just trying right, to right. be a bad yeah. servant. <laughs> so it's right. very, I set myself, <laughs> I set myself an incredibly low uh, threshold there and, and barrier, but I, I, that's another thing that I found very useful. I mean, you know, don't, and some of my instructors would tell me things like this, you know, don't, don't come in thinking you're going to, to crush surfing in one month. I mean, it, it's a life, it's a lifelong path. I mean, you, this is, it doesn't mean you have to start when you're six, but it takes a lot of work to get good at it. So really just try to enjoy the ride as, as you're on it and, and draw what you can from it without having this sort of goal. And we are a very goal oriented society and, and there's nothing wrong with, with goals, but um, I was just trying to sort of step back from that pressure that, you know, and yeah, so none of these things have become uh, or will, will ever become a side hustle for me, unless uh, Rod Stewart, you know, calls up and needs some, needs a backup vocalist or something, you know, like it's, it's, it's not going to happen. But um, you know, no, it's fascinating. I'm going to just remind people to. Um, I think you, yeah, I remind people that in a few minutes I will uh, hopefully move on to questions from uh, from the people watching. So please, um, please uh, 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 come up with some. Uh, uh, that you'd that you'd like to ask, um, and I will and I will pass them along to to Tom. Um, I guess we did mention it very briefly at the beginning, but there is this sense. If I was to sort of, you know, if you want to sort of come up with slightly more hardball questions to put at you, there is this sense that, well, firstly, I'm sure you wouldn't deny this is the kind of it's the kind of thing that you need a certain amount of good fortune in terms of time and resources to be able to, to have a space for this kind of stuff in your life, but also this kind of sense that I get probably just from spending too long on social media, that th we all seem to feel like we're living through, you know, history with a capital H at the moment, not just this week, I would have asked this question uh, prior to this week, um, but it, that it places a sort of great burden of responsibility on us, which I think it does, I doubt you'll disagree, to sort of engage with, with, with politics to figure out what it means to be a, a good citizen and, and um, in terms of activism, in terms of uh, just staying informed and, and, and voting and obviously and all the rest of it. And the go-to assumption is that a skill of the kind that you write about here is gonna be something sort of more sort of inward looking it's going to be something that keeps you in your your little circle but there was a thing I don't recall if it's in the book or in something you've written about the book but you you write very interestingly somewhere about the feeling that at least some of these skills didn't have that effect that they are sort of they do feel make you feel like you're more connected to the the world at large and maybe even more sort of more effective as a member of that world at large. I just think feel like it's a useful thing to think about because it's quite easy uh, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever to conclude that um, all we should be doing in the, in the whole of our um, spare time is trying to prevent various forms of apocalypse. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a great point. And going into this, I was I definitely had a, a sort of self awareness of well, boy, doesn't this, this could come off like a very self-indulgent middle age midlife crisis book of this you know person doing these uh things he's always wanted to do you know blah 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 um and you know and let's just say even before this project i was always a bit inwardly focused and um i don't know if indulgent is the word but uh what i did find as you as you sort of hint at there striking about this so number one i made it a point to really kind of find out about the people I, I was learning with and to try, try to find commonality among these fellow beginners and to try to learn from their experience. So it's not just all about what's going on with, with me because some, th this can be a challenging narrative. I, I was once trying to pitch an article about learning something and the editor was like, uh, I don't really like these sorts of pieces. You know, like day one, oh, I was kind of clumsy. Day two, I sort of got a little bit better. Day yeah. three, I went home and, and now I'm going to <laughs> now I'm going to work on that some more. So, you know, I was sort of conscious of that as well, but um, 
But I think that, and this is one of the biggest things I really didn't expect going into this was this sense of, of being drawn outward and, and you know, something like a something like a choir. I mean, a choir as some research, for example, from Robert Putnam, the political scientist in Italy, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, choirs are, are an amazing, you know, he, he was trying to find out that, you know, which were the most sort of the highest, uh, which parts of Italy, the country of Italy had the highest amounts of social capital. And he was trying to correlate that with all sorts of things like income and, uh, you know, other, other sorts of traditional socioeconomic measures. And he found that it was really sort of these membership in these certain organizations, including choirs, that seemed to correlate most strongly with the social capital. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying joining a choir is like going out there and marching in the streets or doing a phone bank or something, but, you know, it is, this is a way at a time in one's life when it, it can be hard to get out there and make new connections that aren't directly related to, to work or some you know, sort of networking thing and, and to meet people from the proverbial, you know, different walks of life and, and that you may not have met elsewhere. And then to try to find this, this common ground with them and, and literally be in harmony with them as you try to create these harmonies. And um, so, yeah, I, I would like, I guess I would just like to think though that the spirit of, of this, you know, of being a beginner, you know, I, I, I'm leery of the word hobby as well that you use, and I, I always use the word pursuit because it somehow sounds slightly more. Um, yeah, hobby seems like something you go you go to Hobby Lobby and buy things at Hobby right, Lobby and then right. put them together. And there's like nothing should, at all. You should rehabilitate it, but yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, um, but you know, but you can be a beginner in, in all kinds of ways. I mean, uh, you know, volunteering manning political phone banks, which a lot of people were probably very new at during the last election cycle. And that probably, I would, I would imagine, they, they learned a lot about themselves and other people and, and picked up new skills. And they probably went into it with a lot of, of you know, certain amount of trepidation and made some stupid beginner mistakes in the early days. But, um, you know, the, the same spirit, I think, applies. Um, I, I've learned, don't have a British accent if you're trying to persuade an American how to if you're asking an American about their voting habits, do something else that has a good effect instead of, <laughs> instead of phone banking. Um, okay, let's move to some questions that I are coming in here. Here's one um, from uh, Gabriel Brooks. Hi, Tom. What is your favorite song to sing and why? That's, uh, that's to the point. Oh, geez. Um, well, uh, there's <laughs> thanks, Gabriel. But uh, there, there's not one, um, but... Uh, in the book, I mentioned that I was, one of the first songs I tried to sing for my teacher was Time After Time by Chet Baker, uh, which I'm not going to do now, no matter how much you pay me. But, um, you know, and I, I really struggled with this. I, I have the recording of this to this day and it, it's a piece of work, let me tell you. Um, but, you know, so that was, that was sort of a, a mournful uh, ballad, but um, I, I, you know, I like to sing anything and in the spirit of experimentation, um, I'll just give a plug to the app, which is called Smule, S-M-U-L-E, which is a strange name, but it's an online karaoke app. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but during this past COVID year, it sort of saved my singing soul. And, and one of the great things about Smule is that it's a global app. You can sing anything with anyone at any time in any language. So uh, you can just- Collaborative karaoke? What? Yes, usually not live, but you know, someone will record their half of the track and then you join them and you sort of listen oh, to right. it together. And um, so, but it's just a great place to experiment with all kinds of things that aren't fit for public consumption. And I, I should say is, is a very, you know, kind of vulnerable, you know, moment to sort of put this thing out there in the world and then have someone else, you know, and it's social media. So it is a pretty kind community I've found, but like anything, there you, there could be trolls and all that. But um, I just find, you know, there, there's nothing I, I won't try to sing, and that kind of goes just goes to my into one point I'd really like to get across, which is something that has haunted me my whole life, and probably a lot of you listeners out there is that, you know, there's this notion, especially with singing, that it is a God-given gift, and, and you know, he has a gift, she has a gift. Uh, yes, there may be something that a person is born with that makes their, gives their voice an interesting sort of tone or, or texture, but, you know, it, singing, like, like drawing, it, it's a motor skill. It's something that, you know, needs, needs to be worked on, practiced, 
get feedback from a coach that you can improve on. You can see your improvements day by day. Um, so, you know, just, you know, we, we don't, we don't tend to say like, oh, that, that guy who makes croissants, you know, he, he was born to make croissants or um, that, that guy who the UPS driver, who was born to be, you know, there's, but singing, we just sort of, we don't think there's work involved with singing when, when actually there, there's quite a bit. So, and so just, just, Try to get that off my, my chest there. Um, well, the other thing, I, I mean, the thing I, maybe it's not the point you want to make here, but the thing that I find so completely amazing about choral singing is that um, the sum is greater than, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? That actually, it, it, it to my ears anyway, achieves a level of, of uh, uh, quality that, you know, a few of the members of the choir may well be capable of, but I'm certainly not because there are certain, averaging effects and, 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 and stuff like that. So you are actually, you do actually get to be part of something that is sort of better than you are. And at least in my case, better than I think I could be. Um, maybe that also helps me improve. I, I don't know, but there's some. Um, no, and I think it's a great metaphor. metaphor. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I Sorry. just, just to pursue that, I think it's a great metaphor going back to this idea of choir and social capital that, you know, the choir works best when everyone is sort of working cooperatively that, that one or two parties aren't, you know, taking up too much of the oxygen in the room, singing too loudly. And, and it works when voices are different. It works best when, when there's this, you know, choral blend going on. If everyone sort of sounded the same, it, it loses that richness and it's just very loud. And, and, and there's a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting research about this, about, you know, how to achieve that, that blend. And, um, you know, you can, the nice thing about a choir is it can, uh, it can mop up a lot of mistakes and, and, uh, and variations in, in quality. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I was on the sort of, I was on the, well, I was one of the people dra dragging down this thing that, but, but a rising tide, you know, lifts all all um, choral boats here and, and luckily, you know, but, but as I was in that choir though, I, I began to look around and listen and pay attention and, and learn from not just uh, the choir director who you and I both know, Charlie Adams, but from my fellow singers who, you know, some of whom were a lot better than me, some of whom were novices and I could then take the little bit that I had learned and try to sort of teach them a little bit or, or you know, give them a, a welcoming hand, which is just another, a bit of a cliche here, but you know, there's there's nothing quite so effective for learning as as teaching, uh, even at the lowest levels of of beginnerdom. Yeah, I do. Let me. Oh no, that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that question if there's time. Let me move on now to question. Great question from Julie Clam. If there were no limitations on a pursuit you could have chosen, no limitations of time, money, logistics, what would you have loved to take on? Oh, geez. Um, Great question, Julie. Um, geez, uh, astronaut, astronaut training, NASA. I mean, like just go through the whole program, soup to nuts. I don't know, like go to space, right? I mean, what you know, why, why not, right? That's uh, uh, oh, the if they come down one level from that and say, like, was there were there things that you sort of um, were there things that you auditioned here, but that it would have, but that you know, your your criteria of remaining in New York or your criterion of that it would take, uh, you know, uh, more money. No, that, that's, that's fair. I, I did put out this, I put out this call for ideas from friends and I, I got some you know, great suggestions back. I told you coding. Mountain climbing it does interest me, although, you know, as a 50 year old parent, it's not, not the, you know, not something that's with, with questionable health insurance, not something that you take up lightly. Um, okay. uh, one friend suggested he really had a great time at Gelato University in Italy, which uh, you could become a master. I'm not sure what the exact word is, gelato maker, uh, which you know sounded sounded great, but it's Italy and it, that now that seems talking about indulgent. That seems indulgent. So I, kind I mean, of feel like I could probably insult a lot of expert gelato makers, but I kind of feel like that's something I could hope to uh, to to become. It's probably totally totally false. Maybe, just maybe it's just I'm confusing that with my well, love of eating gelato. Perhaps, but you raise an interesting book, an interesting idea there, which is this idea of what uh, I think his name is Robert uh, Twiggers, if I have the name right. He wrote a book called Micro Mastery. Yeah. And this idea that, you know, there are a lot of these sort of smaller skills that are out there that I think a lot of us are learning all the time, but, you know, our nice little 
if you don't have the time for the epic quest to, you know, sing opera or, or whatever, you know, uh, learn to drive uh, manual transmission in, in a car. I mean, e even if it's not that incredibly useful for your life, it's, it's this thing that was probably a hindrance to you in, in your mind. Oh, I don't know how to drive stick. Um, yeah. Just spend a few days. And, you know, so I, I sort of avoided those as well in the book because I just thought there, there wouldn't be as much narrative potential. I mean, I, you know, and I think, you know, the internet has really revolutionized micro mastery in that the amount of, of, of resources that are out there is, is just amazing. I mean, I watched a video, for example, on the correct way to chop an onion, which, you know, <laughs> sounds sort of ridiculous, but number one, I was basically doing it poorly my entire life until I watched this technique. Number two, I've saved, you know, X amount of time in the kitchen, you know, since I learned it. And it just, you know, gave me that little, little boost. So, and someone sees me doing it like, Hey, I, I like that technique. And, you know, it's, yeah. So don't, you know, don't, I don't discount micro mastery as well. There's two questions here that I, I don't want to bunch them together because then one gets missed out, but they sort of follow on, I think in a way. So I'm going to start with one from our mutual uh, friend, Andrew Bloom. So sorry, we're not on Fulton street. I think that's a mutual friend. I don't want to assume anything. It's a, uh, 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 anyway, I wonder if, you made friends in these new pursuits or really how your relationship with the people in the book was different than it might have been if they were strictly your journalistic subjects and then I want to move on to a question that I think is to do with how this works in lockdown uh, and the lack of uh, human contact but but that's an interesting question I mean um because the book does sort of, you are treading this line, obviously, you are spending time with people, you're getting to know them, you're making friends, it doesn't work for you just to be sitting in a corner studying them with your notebook. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and that, that was a very new experience for me. I'm, I'm not usually, usually the people I have in my books are, are very formal interviews, they're sort of academics or people that are really expecting to be interviewed, not, not just, you know, it's, it's definitely sort of like, I don't know, you know, Janet Malcolm territory for me or something where, um, and, and in some cases I just use people's first names or, or not even their real name just to give them uh, a bit of privacy if they like. Not that, not that there was anything salacious or, or negative about what I was saying, um, but it, it is an interesting experience too. And I've been getting, the reaction coming back so far has been positive, but it, um, you know, I, I don't, <laughs> you, you always have that fear that you've, you know, sort of someone might get the sense that you've betrayed them somehow or, port or portrayed them in incorrectly. But um, I think, you know, the, the, the over overriding sense I've gotten so far is that people just like to see this experience they're going through, you know, sort of stepped back from it and thought about and, and to have a sense that other people are going through the same things or having the same thoughts that they might be. And I mean, that to me has always been one of the great pleasures of reading is, is, you know, going back to when I was a kid, you know, like you're reading a book and like, oh, I, I thought I was the only person that actually ever had that thought. And lo and behold, no. So, uh, and I'm sorry, the, uh, the second question there. Oh, no, I was going to say, this is from Neil Lapuma. Small looks like a cool resource to improve singing. What were other resources you discovered to aid in other pursuits? And this is not quite a question about lockdown necessarily but I think it's a useful one to sort of if it's a point people towards who might be like excited by this stuff but um you know right now don't have the opportunity to exactly emulate a whole bunch of the stuff that you that you write about here. yeah great question um and just in in singing let's see there's a, an app called pitch perfect which is on your on your iphone that is just a thing that you sing scales into and you get a one through 100 score on how well you did. And I'll, I'll just say that when I started out, I was you know hitting the 50s uh, out, out of 100. So I was really not in, in tune at all and, and have made improvement on that and can even get 100 sometimes. But um, uh, other things, you know, uh, chess, chess is just an infinite universe of learning opportunities. There's a, a, a Chessable, which is a, a website that uses techniques of spaced repetition, which are really effective for learning. There's a million people out there with lessons, historical games. Uh, lately, I've been enjoying a grandmaster named Daniel Naraditsky, who's been playing a series of blitz games from a very low rating all the way up. He wants to get up to 3,000. And he's analyzing these games very carefully as he goes along. So even if you're just a beginner, he, he's starting by playing beginners and, and showing, showing you what 
mistakes those beginners are making. So that, that's been a great resource. Um, surfing is a bit tough. You sort of have to get out there and surf. You can do some work with in your apartment, you know, just, you know, uh, doing planks and trying to uh, balance board and things like that, or, or visualizing motor skills. There's a certain, a certain eff effectiveness to just thinking about things you've learned, uh, having as, almost as much efficacy as, as doing them, um, not, not quite. Um, drawing, uh, all the drawing classes I was taking, for example, at the New York Academy of Art have moved online. And I, I was a bit, I, I was a bit skeptical when this whole thing began. I really enjoyed being in the building, number one, and being, which is this great building in Tribeca, surrounded by sort of real, you know, real artists. Uh, I just love the ritual of going there, of, of talking to the fellow students, of having the instructor, you know, hold my pencil and, and show me this stuff. Um, so I was skeptical, but I, I took one recently and was really, you know, quite impressed with the whole process. I didn't really feel like I was losing as much as I, as I thought I would. And in fact, there were even some new tools the, the teachers had, for example, they could kind of through a digital overlay, correct, you know, show me some correct potential corrections to drawings I was making with kind of a, an Apple pen sort of thing that you, you couldn't actually do with a, a real pencil. So um, I think, yeah, there's, there's a huge amount of resources out there. Um, as I mentioned in the book, pretty much anything you want to learn, you can find on YouTube. I mean, the quality does vary, so you have to be careful, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, and here's a question from your agent, Zoe Paglamenta. Why the hell haven't you? No, no, that's not the question. Um, she's not hassling you for some document you've got to submit. No, what are some things that you'd still like to learn? I think that's, uh, I mean, uh, this is a question I have as well. I mean, there must be specific, uh, unless you go about this in a different way than I predict, then I, then I guess you, you would have generated more leads than you were able to focus in on and more, more sort of uh, possibilities than you were able to, to, to focus on. So if you, if you did a whole second, uh, second volume, uh, what, what, what would be in there? Well, I mean, one, interestingly, you know, a, a lot of the skills I, I, I would like to do next are, are actually outgrowths of the things I'm already sort of doing. And this is the sense where skill learning is such an additive and, and addictive sort of thing where, okay, I began with drawing and drawing leads most naturally to painting, of course, for, for most people. Um, but then I was sort of, you know, walking through New York Art Academy one day and saw some, some sculpture classes. I was like, wow, that's, I, I'd really like to sort of get my hands and work in that sort of 3D, see, see, it, see how much of, the, of what I learned in drawing in this two-dimensional two medium, how much of that can apply or doesn't apply. And it also just looks incredibly fun. And um, but I, I, let, I let sort of life guide a lot of other uh, decisions. For example, my daughter has recently joined this, this mountain biking club and I've, I've never really been a mountain biker. I, I mentioned road cycling, but I can't stand just sort of seeing her leave for this hour and a half practice looking like she's having fun. And there's some adult coaches on that team. So I have just bought a mountain bike and I'm going to you know, set out to at least get competent enough to be a coach at that. So, you know, yeah, I mean, the. the it's just really about time. And I, I know we're talking about indulgence, but yeah, I do have to pay the bills and I, I don't, I have as much, one of the biggest problems with working on this book is how guilty I felt when I wasn't practicing one of the things I was supposed to be practicing when I had an article to write you know, right. for actual money. And so I would advise people against taking on too many things at once because you know, you're just gonna feel bad at the end of the day, but. <laughs> Um, well, I think um, we probably have to start wrapping it up there, though if you type a question in very fast while I'm talking now, um, uh, I will still be able to ask it, I think. Um, I just want to say, I mean, I think this book is fantastic, and if you haven't already bought it, you should buy it. it, it it's, it's the fact that, I mean, it is incredibly well written, very, very funny, totally absorbing account of your journey, but I'm one of those people who does kind of want there to be some useful takeaway stuff as well and it's got that in 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 in, in heaps it's um it's so uh you know and, and often what you have you have to choose between these two things in a book quite often uh, and and you don't here it's like it's uh it's uh it's a hugely engrossing and absorbing read but it also sort of gives me items for my to-do list that i'm really keen to start sort of implementing i don't think that means that i'm going to try to learn to surf in the rockaways maybe i am 
That, does that carry on in um, in COVID times? I guess it's out. It's it could be done. Uh, it's it does. Yeah, but with with precautions. Right. I mean, you usually don't want to be within six feet of someone anyway. Pre pre pandemic, uh, okay. it's sometimes hard to avoid in New York City. New York City is a crowded place, but um, I, I will say, you know, yeah, I was doing a lot of sort of. I'm, it's, it's wrong to call it guerrilla surfing because it was completely legal, but I did feel a bit, I was doing a lot of surfing during the pandemic because it was outdoors and it was keeping me sane and it was healthy and there was no one around because turns out people don't like to go surfing so much when it's 22 degrees out. But um, anyway. <laughs> um, if I can bring uh, Katie back in here, I think. Let's... Oh, Hello. Hello. Right. <laughs> Thank you both so much for that fantastic discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, if you missed any of tonight's event or if you just want to watch it again, we will be posting the recording to our YouTube. So please look out for it there. And don't forget to buy your copy of Beginners in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. The buy link is in the chat. And don't forget to note in the comment section if you do want a signed copy. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Oliver. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.